Good afternoon and welcome to today's New York Foreign Press Center briefing. My name is Daphne Stavropoulos and I'm today's moderator. It's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Mario Cordero, Executive Director of the Port of Long Beach, California. He's an international maritime industry leader, a Long Beach resident and attorney who was named to the post as Executive Director by the Long Beach Board of Harbor Commissioners in 2017. This briefing is on the record. The views expressed by briefers not affiliated with the Department of State or the U.S. government are their own and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Department of State or U.S. government. We ask that if you publish a story from this briefing that you share it with us. Following his presentation, I'll open the floor to questions. If you have a question, go to the participant field and raise your virtual hand and wait for me to call on you. When called on, please enable both your audio and your video and identify yourself and your outlet. And with that, it's my pleasure to turn it over to today's briefer, Mr. Cordero. Thank you so much for joining us, sir. Thank you, Daphne, and thank you to the Foreign Press Center. Uh, good afternoon and welcome everyone at the Port of Long Beach. Uh, we're pleased that you could be, you know, you could join us today here. I know it's been quite an ordeal recently in New York with the weather, so I appreciate you having made time for us. So first of all, I'd like to thank the Biden administration for its attention to the country's supply chain situation. We welcome the appointment of Envoy John Bakari to the Administration Supply Chain Disruption Task Force. I know that Envoy Bakari brings keen insight to this important task. We're grateful that the Biden administration is making this a priority and we stand ready to assist in any way that we can. I look forward to meeting Mr. Bakari and working together on solutions to supply chain disruptions. Many of you have probably reported on the fact that we've had record cargo, record breaking cargo volumes here. Starting in July, 2020 at the San Peter Bay Porch Complex. The San Peter Bay includes the neighboring Port of Los, Los Angeles and of course here, the Port of Long Beach. It is the nation's largest port complex. After the slow start due to the COVID-19 pandemic, 2020 turned out to be a record year for the Port of Long Beach. We moved 8.1 million containers in 2020. And as you know, 2021 has also been challenging, but we have persevered. Along the way, we had some remarkable numbers, including our best month ever, over 900,000 containers in May, 2021. And now we've hit our best August ever with more than 807,000 containers, which is up 11.3% from the same month in 2020. It is the 13th time in the last 14 months that we have achieved a monthly record. Eight months through this year, we can safely forecast that 2021 will be another record-breaking year for the Pearl Long Beach. The record volume of cargo is driven by a surge in imports and consumer spending. Peak season has arrived and the volume continues. Many of you are following the numbers of ships that wait outside the ports around the world. The San Peter Bay ports of Long Beach and Los Angeles just last week hit a new high for ships at anchor outside the harbor with 44 ships. By the end of last week, it was down to 37. The previous high was in February of this year at 40 ships. Keep in mind, that's a number that was reduced to only nine this past June. Economists and supply chain experts expect that cargo surge to continue into the summer of 2022. If the surge continues into the summer of 22, that means there will be no typical lunar year in terms of a low point as annually that does occur. January and February can be some of the slowest months at the year at the ports here that serve the Trans Pacific trade routes. However, I expect the volume to be climbing. So you may ask, what are we doing better to handle this volume? Let it be known that we are partnering with our marine terminal operators and labor in a full court press to reduce the backlog. One major step that is helping right away is the recent completion of the Long Beach Container Terminal Construction Project. Aside from a few finishing touches. The third and final phase of the 300 acre terminal is now complete. The project costs $1.49 billion 
and took 10 years to construct. The result is a state-of-the-art container terminal with advanced technology and zero emission operations. The terminal is an environmental model. We've electrified with 100% clean shore power for ships at birth, expanded the on-dock rail yard to minimize truck trips, and constructed green buildings. The 300-acre property is now able to move 3.5 million containers a year. That throughput would rank this terminal alone as the sixth busiest port in the United States. The 4,200 foot long deep water wharf can accommodate three mega vessels at once. The truck turn times at the Long Beach Container Terminal are among the fastest in the San Pedro Bayport complex. That's one example of how in the past, we were planning ahead for bigger ships. As it worked out, we were able to add significant capacity exactly when we needed it. The newly completed third phase added 1 million containers for an annual capacity. We are now taking steps for short term as well. The short term, excuse me, the short term overflow resource, or as we refer to it, the store project, is working well to provide much needed off terminal capacity for container staging. We are expanding it from 49 to 64 acres. We will keep it open throughout the surge but it's time to look for additional land outside the Harbor District to offer even more staging areas to help move container cargo to its destination. We've just launched a truck alert system that updates our port truckers in real time on traffic conditions in the Harbor District via text message. We created the weekly advanced volume estimate, also known as the wave report to allow every part of the supply chain to access the information that makes it easier for them to plan their needs for equipment and labor. We met our most significant challenge, COVID-19, head on in August 2020. We opened a COVID-19 testing site right in the port complex, primarily serving the workforce of the San Pedro Bay. We closed the testing site after one year of operation and our health department continues to provide testing at sites throughout the city. We advocated successfully for early priority vaccinations for our waterfront workers. And vaccination teams from our health department have been making visits to dock cargo ships at both the Port of Long Beach and the Port of Los Angeles since mid-May. Under this program, more than 4,500 international sailors on 300 ships have received one dose of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. We will continue to facilitate this program as long as it is necessary and there is a demand. Looking at the long term, what are the solutions? Many years ago, the forecast for the San Pedro Bay ports accurately predicted that the level of cargo we would have in 2021 would be upwards of 19 million containers. And that will be a record surpassing 2020's 17.3 million containers with the nation's two busiest port complex or authorities here at this complex. We know that cargo is going to increase. Our port complex is projected to have to move 28 million TEUs by 2030. What are we going to do to provide that capacity? I think the answer lies in 24 seven operations. Yes, it's a long-term vision. High-performing terminals in Asia already are 24-7, and our supply chain needs to adapt to that reality. With the growth of e-commerce, consumers can shop easily at 4 in the morning or 4 in the afternoon. They expect rapid delivery. It's a time that we all accept this and move past the current status quo to 24-7 operations. Of course, this is going to take time. We need it because we're only gonna see more volume. It's time to start addressing how we move things differently in the future so that we can accommodate the expected growth. Thank you. Thank you so much for those remarks. Um, we can move into the question uh, 
portion and Q and A portion of today's briefing. Um, if you have, have a question, please raise your virtual hand and wait for me to call on you. Um, or you, if you are having audio issues, feel free to type it into the chat and I will read it out loud. Well, maybe to get started, you can tell me a little bit about supply chain um, uh, predictions for the holiday season as we're getting closer. Well, uh, Daphne, again, um, the volume will continue. And, and to be candid, the supply chain uh, disruption related matters uh, are, are, are not going to be a short term solution. Uh, the good news is we have a lot of volume. The economy is, is the trajectory is moving up strong consumer demand, but again, because of a confluence of factors with regard to the global supply chain, uh, there will be some delays. So um, I think, again, we're doing everything we can here at the Port of Long Beach to have, a, as I indicated, to have a full court press to address any potential efficiency, short-term resolutions we could put in place. Thank you. Um, I have a question from um, Amel Akan. Amel, can you introduce yourself and outlet. Hello, uh, this is Amela Khan from the Epoch Times. Um, Mr. Cardora, thank you so much. I couldn't open my uh, uh, video. I'm sorry for that. Uh, I would like to know if you, during this time, busy time, uh, have you increased your fees uh, in the port? And also, have you uh, been experiencing worker shortage like many businesses in, in, the, in the country? And my uh, third question uh, is, uh, do you see any bottlenecks in your port operation arising from the um, problems uh, uh, from other countries, other ports like China? Thank okay, you. Well, ML, thank you for your question. Number one, we have not increased our fees. Now, as you know, here at the San Pedro Bay complex, we're a landlord port authority model. Uh, so our private sector terminals uh, are the ones that actually uh, obviously run the terminals, but they have not increased uh, any fees, nor has the port authority uh, during this crisis. In terms of the labor shortage, I could represent to you that the men and women on the docks moving these containers uh, they've been working day in, day out since this pandemic commenced uh, in, in early spring of 2020. Uh, and again, uh, there is no shortage of labor on the docks. Obviously, we have a lot of volume. Now, I will say that as it relates to the supply chain, uh, there are issues with regard to uh, labor at the warehouse and distribution centers in the region. Uh, but again, uh, you know, the whole nation's uh, undergoing that experience and certainly the supply chain has not been immune with regard to the labor shortage. And last, I think your question was with regard to the delays and that have occurred in Asia, more specifically China and Vietnam for that matter. Uh, well, that's a great question, Amel. As, as you know, the, the Sun, Southern California Bay complex here, San Peter Bay complex, a port complex, uh, Primarily, this is the epicenter for imports from Asia to the United States. So anytime there are delays and impacts at the ports of origin, uh, you're definitely going to see that domino effect here, which is one of the reasons we've had these vessels at anchor. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think I mentioned we've hit as high as 44, 46 vessels at anchor last week. But, and that's due, uh, one factor is anytime you close a terminal in China, for example, the terminal at Mishan or the Mishan terminal in Ningbo, uh, you know, Ningbo, that, that gateway moves around 23 to 25 million containers. Uh, you shut a terminal down, it's going to have an impact here in Southern California. Prior to that, as you know, a few months back, uh, there was a terminal in Shenzhen that closed, and, uh, or excuse me, in Yantian that was closed. And again, it has similar repercussion here in Southern California. So suffice to say that the COVID-19 crisis is not over. It's not going to be over anytime soon. The Delta variant is problematic. So, uh, you know, we're prepared to continue to unfor unforeseen events with regard to the uh, movement of cargo in the global supply chain. 
Thank you so much. Uh, next question goes to Pearl. Pearl, um, feel free to introduce yourself and your outlet. Go ahead. Um, yes, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Pearl Mativi here, um, Newsday Zimbabwe. Um, my question is regarding anything you might be able to share uh, in terms of Africa. I know at the beginning of COVID-19, Africa was having some uh, supply chain challenges, um, accessing certain goods related to uh, COVID, uh, but maybe speak not, you know, not only on COVID uh, items, but what is the kind of volume or gap in volume that maybe fell off at the start of COVID and, and what does that look like now uh, in terms of uh, movement of goods and shipping towards the continent? Thanks. Well, Peril, um, and thank you for your question. In, in this uh, movement of international uh, cargo movement, international trade, uh, uh, before the pandemic, there have been two areas that have been talked about as emerging markets. And one of them is Africa. And the other, of course, here in the Western Hemisphere is Latin America. So Africa has become uh, a big player now with regard to the international trade movement. Uh, now, unfortunately for the West Coast here in the United States, uh, the volumes from uh, and the trade with Africa is is not as much as it is to the East Coast of the United States. So, but I do know that again, as you are aware, uh, Africa uh, in terms of raw materials uh, is a big continent with regard to the raw materials that it has to offer for the export market. But in terms of the consumer market, more and more as some of these undeveloped countries continue to evolve and particularly in the African continent, uh, consumer demand in Africa will continue to escalate. So it will be a, 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 a factor here as we continue to move forward. And like I said, it's, it's one of the noted emerging markets in this industry. Thank you so much. Um, we had a question come in prior to today's briefing. Um, uh, if you could elaborate a little bit um, about your cargo handling equipment, I understand that it makes up the largest zero emissions fleet um, on any marina container terminal in the world. So maybe you could share um, a little bit more about uh, about that. Uh, thank you, Daphne. Yeah, we just uh, completed a 10-year endeavor here, and that is the completion of the state-of-the-art terminal, the Long Beach Container Terminal. It's a about a 305-acre area uh, with the capability that uh, we will be moving 3.5 million containers uh, and of course, the, the cranes there, the ship to shore of cranes are as tall as 300 feet uh, in, in, in height. And, and the capability of what they'll be able to do in terms of servicing uh, mega vessels that have come to this terminal. Uh, and with all that capability, uh, the most important factor that really commenced this endeavor was the reducing the impact to the environment, more specifically the air quality impacts. Uh, this container terminal is now twice as big, Long Beach container terminal that what it once was. And of course, it will be uh, emitting uh, in excess of 50% less of emissions from that operation. So I think from an environmental perspective, it, it's, a, it's a great project. And I think the cargo handling equipment there is again, state of the art. And so we're very proud, not only with regard to what that means to reduce environmental impacts, as you know, for the Port of Long Beach, as well as the Port of LA, our goal is to have zero emission cargo handling equipment by the year 2030. So we are certainly moving uh, progressively on that road. Perfect, well, thank you so much. Um, there is a question from Felicia. Felicia, please go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, uh, my name is Felicia Ackerman. I'm with the Swedish Business Daily, Dagens Industri. Uh, you talked earlier about moving to 24-7 operations. What are the main obstacles for that to become a reality and what would be a realistic time frame? That's a great question, Felicia. Uh, as I indicated, the, the, the 24 model is not new. I mean, I, you know, we have to look, all we have to do is look at Asia in terms of how they operate. Uh, and I think in terms of what are the obstacles, 
you know, no matter what industry that uh, you look at, anytime you move from a status quo model to more of a visionary model, uh, there's always questions, uh, you know, and legitimate questions for that matter. But I think uh, one of the questions that, uh, uh, or legitimate question with regard to obstacles that people raise is what is the cost that's involved? And there is a cost issue to this. However, from my perspective, what is the cost of doing nothing? And you could probably see that the impact of delays and the rise in consumer prices, uh, that's a considerable cost that far uh, uh, exceeds whatever financial cost uh, results from moving cargo 24 seven. Uh, and in terms of how long this would take to accomplish, you know, I think admittedly it's a long-term vision. And, and by the way, uh, it's not any particular sector that's responsible or has the obligation for this. Uh, you know, my vision is one of the supply chain, uh, a 24 seven supply chain, particularly at a complex like the San Peter Bay complex here at the Port of Long Beach, where, like I said, we're gonna be moving 19 million containers this year uh, to EUs. And in fact, the latest estimate as of yesterday by, by staff, we may reach 20 million. So you cannot move that volume with old models of yesterday. So I think it's gonna take time to get to a 24 seven operation. And I think what I foresee is incremental steps to do that, where for example, you might have five days, 16 hours a day, uh, rain or shine, those gates will be open. And, what, and when that happens, uh, Felicia, my prediction is the supply chain will adjust to that. It will be a domino effect because for this to be effective, it's not just the marine terminals. It has to be the truckers, the warehouses, the railroads. Uh, and, but again, I think the last I'll say to this question, which I think I really appreciate this question, is when you stop and think about it, 24 seven is not new with regard to the international carriers. Those vessels are 24 seven. When they arrived at any port, the expectation that is you load and unload that carrier day in and around the clock, day and night. And of course, in the United States, if you ask class one railroads, they are 24 seven. So why it's a vision and, and there are obstacles, it's certainly not unrealistic. So I believe time will prove me correct. Thank you. Um, the next question comes in from Manik Mehta. He's a syndicated journalist. He says, um, you are mainly a container port. Do you also have any break bulk traffic? Could you give figures for your container traffic in the first eight, first eight or six months of this year compared to last year? Long Beach is known as a gateway to China, but there are other markets in China. Where do you, where do you see good business potential? What about Southeast Asia and particularly India, with, in, excuse me, India, which is a huge market? Thank you. Well, uh, there was an earlier question regarding uh, emerging markets. You know, we talked about Africa and Latin America. But with regard to the epicenter of manufacturing, it has been China for many, many years. And in the short term, it will continue to be China. However, we have seen that manufacturing base move to Southeast Asia or specifically Vietnam. And of course, you know, China, uh, excuse me, India has been talked about for many years about the potential that India has, which it does have much potential. So I think uh, as the years uh, come, I think you're gonna see the manufacturing movement uh, that, that is the global manufacturing movement start shifting. Uh, to what extent? Uh, I don't know, but obviously, uh, this whole question really commenced with the trade war uh, with, that the prior administration uh, um, uh, uh, took on. And of course, when that trade war court occurred, which is still on, by the way, I mean, the tariffs have not gone away. Uh, then, of course, there was a question in terms of, <clears throat> you know, shippers starting to thinking uh, China plus one. That is, your manufacturing base being China, but you have an alternative. Uh, such as like Vietnam. 
Uh, and I think that's going to be a continued viable discussion. And I think I know India is doing all it can to make sure they continue to move towards a competitive level to offer uh, uh, to be a player in this international uh, water uh, cargo movement. So uh, yeah, so I think again, we'll probably see more of that. I want to give an opportunity to uh, the two uh, individuals who've called in to ask a question. If you have a question, uh, I believe you can press star six to unmute yourself. Right, we can always come back. Um, this administration has uh, placed quite a priority on um, infrastructure, and um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the role ports play um, with the President Biden's uh, plan. Well, from a port perspective, <clears throat> it's welcome that we have an administration who talks about ports. When President Biden was introducing his American infrastructure plan and uh, not only did he say highway and bridges, he also said ports. And right now, as it's being proposed, ports will be a beneficiary of specific funding as it relates to the nation's infrastructure. Now, of course, is it sufficient funding? You know, uh, we could argue that uh, we need so much more dollars to really remain competitive here in terms of the uh, maritime port infrastructure. However, it is certainly uh, appreciated and it's a milestone whenever you have an infrastructure project, excuse me, an infrastructure plan moving forward through for, uh, our congressional leaders, but there's specific language in terms of what it means for ports and inland waterways. So uh, again, from my perspective, it's, it's welcome news and it's a breath of fresh air to have an administration that not only talks about infrastructure in terms of bridge and highways, but also what that means to the maritime port community. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'll give everyone just a, a moment more to uh, raise their hand to get in one last question. Um, if you do, please raise your hand, your virtual hand, or uh, let me know via the chat room. Right. You know, I can uh, put our journalists um, who are on the Zoom today in touch with uh, some of your colleagues, Mr. Cordero, for follow-up questions. And I will also be sharing um, a press uh, kit that has been put together by your team. So um, with that, uh, I believe we, um, I can give you the floor if you have any last uh, comments or any, anything you wanted to say before we wrap up. No, I just want to thank you, Daphne, and the Foreign Press Center for this opportunity. And again, uh, obviously, obviously, when we talk about the uh, uh, the extent of consumer demand here in the United States, uh, I think the good news in terms of what that has brought with regard to e-commerce and the whole dynamic of what I, you know, what I say, having an Amazon state of mind, I think the Port Authorities, not only just the Port of Long Beach, I will represent that the Port Gateways across the nation. Uh, are stepping up and are, are doing the best we can to make sure we move that cargo because again it's a new day today the american consumer expects their shipments tomorrow right and that's why i'm strongly advocating that when you have uh, a, a change in terms of the expectations of how that works uh, port authorities need to also think out of the box and how we change our models so for the southern california port complex the nation's largest port complex that change for me is the strive for a 24 seven operation. Well, thank you so much for giving your time. I really appreciate it. Thanks to everyone who joined us today. Um, as uh, to recap, today's briefing was on the record. I will share a transcript um, as soon as uh, it's available. And again, thank you so much and good afternoon. Thank you.